gospel, is, at least for me, is very painful. And the reason it's so painful is because Jesus, <coughs> in this one particular gospel, or the gospel writer, likes to, or felt it was necessary to highlight the tremendous amount of opposition that Jesus received in his ministry. The minute he begins his ministry, he's wrestling with the devil. He has the religious establishment to wrestle with, ultimately the political establishment. Uh, his family opposes him. And uh, probably most painful of all, his disciples okay, are uh, opposing him and in, and in opposition. And Jesus has challenge after challenge and hurdle after hurdle. But probably his uh, most uh, serious moment, uh, the moment where he is double-minded or at least for a short time, or he looks like he's going to compromise perhaps, is when he comes to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, it's, it is pretty curious that the Gospel gives us uh, gives us two details about where Jesus is praying. One, it's on the Mount of Olives, and two, it's in a place called Getz, Gethsemane. Usually the Gospel isn't directly so interested in geographical details, but in both cases, uh, these are quite significant. The first is the location on the Mount of Olives. When Jesus comes to this place and he prays, he's tempted to run. He's tempted to quit. And uh, what makes the temptation not theoretical, but actually a, a serious option for Jesus, is that no matter where he is on this mountain, all he has to do is run to the top and go over the other side. And he's in the Judean desert. Once you're in the Judean desert, no one's there. No one's going to come after you. He has really uh, an escape into the wilderness. Jesus has an easy way out. Thankfully, he doesn't take that. Secondly, he's playing at a, praying at a place called Gatshmoni, which in Hebrew means an olive press. Uh, and what's very, maybe perhaps ironic, is that the place where he's praying really foreshadows what's going to happen to Jesus in just a few hours. Within 16 hours of him praying in this garden, like an olive press, he will be crushed and uh, his life will be s squeezed uh, uh, out of him. So those two details uh, uh, are very, very important for us. And so from our gospel account today that we read, we see that Jesus is in anguish. He takes his three disciples. He separates himself from the rest of the disciples. Uh, he, he tells his disciples to watch and pray. And Jesus goes a certain distance beyond that, and he falls to the ground. He says he's in great anguish, he's in great distress, his heart is full of sorrow, and he's asking the Father, take this cup from me. If this is your will, remove what is about to come upon me. And so Jesus is facing the temptation, he's facing the trial. And the place where Jesus finds victory is kind of simple, it's in prayer. dependent upon the Father. After about an hour of prayer, he's able to say to the Father, not your will, but my will. Sorry, not my will, sorry, but your will, excuse me. Um, and then he told his disciples to do the same thing. He said, you watch and pray. But the disciples don't watch and pray. Either then the, the night is too late, or they're full of sorrow because they anticipate something's going to happen that's not going to end well. And instead of watching and praying, they're doing the opposite. They're sleeping. They're sleeping. And they fail because they 
in a sense, they fail to see what's going on, uh, and they fail in their duty as disciples. And what was that duty? That duty was to comfort and support their rabbi, to, have, to support Jesus, especially in this time of time of, of trial. They don't watch, meaning they're not spiritually alert, and they don't pray. They fail to test. Jesus passes the test. The disciples, by not praying, uh, fail the test. They should have been not only watching for Jesus, they should have been watching out for each other. And each individual should have been watching out for, uh, uh, watching out for himself. And consequently, uh, <coughs> Jesus comes back and has to rebuke them three times for their failure to, to uh, failure to pray. Uh, and they end up falling into end up falling into temptation. And those words uh, to to watch and pray to overcome our over either o overcome our trial, overcome the temptation that we happen to be in, overcome our uh, our double mindedness uh, is Jesus's solution. We see this also in the Book of Hebrews. For uh, the, the way of victory, that you might say, the way of victory in this case is pray, pray, pray. Those words, watch and pray, also should remind us of Mark 13. It's in Mark 13 that Jesus talks about the end of the age and the end of the world. And so Jesus also says to watch and to pray, to be spiritually alert, um, and to be prayerful dependent upon the Lord at all times. Um, and he says that we should watch and pray that we are not, uh, we are in this case, not deceived. And my dear friends, I don't know if we're on the eve of the end of the world or if we're at the end of, the, at the end of an age, but we do live in a very dangerous time and in a very wicked generation. And if Jesus was here today, he would probably say, watch and pray that we do not end up being deceived, that we do not end up following a false Christ or believing in a false gospel. And so those words in Matthew 13 would be just as uh, pertinent then um, as they would be now. So whether it's we're living in a dangerous and wicked time or whether we're just facing uh, daily trials, daily temptations, uh, an inability to become single-minded about anything. We just we should be reminded that uh, the solution that uh, Jesus offers us in Mark's Gospel is a life of prayer, uh, an intimacy with God, and a dependency upon Him to help us through these difficult 